We are excited to be here. And this is Cheryl Oxley. Uh, Courtney and I are very thankful for all of you who have uh, taken the time out today to listen to us and attend our Gig Economy webinar. Um, over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to cover a broad overview of topics uh, really related to around that gig economy. So one of the big things here we'd like to start off with is level setting on what is the gig economy, what it is uh, that we're talking about here. I know many of you might have heard of the term gig economy, but we want to provide some baseline understanding of what the gig economy actually is. We'll cover some myths and stereotypes of gig workers. And then finally, to the best part of our presentation, we'll cover ways that you can stay competitive in the gig economy. I'd like to start off here with a quick poll so we can get a better understanding of our callers today and our participants on the line. So for this poll, we'd like to know, how many of you work for an organization that employs gig workers today? Just a simple yes or no response here. And Courtney and I are very excited to see the results. We have some guesses on how this will uh, play out. But if you could go ahead and take part in that poll, poll that Holly mentioned at the top of the call, that would be great. Where do you think it's going to shake out, Courtney? I don't know. I'm curious to see how many traditional companies we have versus gig companies we have. And it, it's actually more, it looks more evenly split than I originally anticipated. Oh, yeah. So. It's I assumed we'd have more kind of traditional oh, folks. Oh, there it goes, a little oh, bit okay. higher. <laughs> <laughs> Think about a, another couple seconds here or so. And just because your company isn't necessarily a gig company in, in how you classify yourselves, it's more just you have workers that even you offer kind of gig benefits to. So that might be another way to think about this. That increased some <laughs> participation there, Courtney. There we go. <laughs> right, 50-50. Very nice. All right, Holly, what do you think? We're ready to close? There it goes down a little bit. All right. All right, so it looks like we ended up there about a 50% no, 48% yes. So we got a good even split. And it's very interesting for us to, to understand all of you on the line and you know maybe really level set and how we're we going to incorporate gig into more uh, more gig economy and more gig mindset into our organizations and as we go into this conversation just really understanding what gig means you know we talk about it we're shortening it Courtney and I talk about gig all the time uh, but when you think about gig for purposes of today we want to make sure that you have this in the frame of gig is a really around organizations that contract with independent workers for really those short-term engagements. A lot of us might think of GIG as Uber or Lyft, but it's much more than that. And we'll get into the details of how that uh, really fleshes out for organizations, especially those who are focused on human capital management. And when we think about how this GIG economy formed, we know that uh, temporary or contract works or independent contractors have been around for a really long time. But what differentiates the gig economy and gig workers from uh, more traditional mindsets, really the modern day definition is really centered around the technology component. So technology and the way that we leverage apps and our phones and access to quick access to people and to services, that really defines how the gig economy came to be within the last decade. And over the last decade, we also are just coming out of one of the largest recessions we've ever been a part of in modern times. So probably one of the things that we really like to uh, focus on is that that recession really created a need for people and workers to find additional means to fill their pocketbooks, uh, provide their services, and that technology platform allowed, allowed them to do that. But the need came from a recession. We needed, there wasn't enough work to go around, there were different ways people were trying to find jobs and to put their services out there. So the recession really instigated this gig economy that has continued over the course of an, an improving com economy because of the concept of what we call a side hustle. Uh, it's kind of a fun way to think about the gig economy because people no longer necessarily need a um, another opportunity for gig type work, but what they do want is something fun to do where they have a unique service or skill set that they like to have on the side. So they might be employed full time, but they have opportunities to provide services on the side, what we call a side hustle. 
And one of one in four Americans today are earning money through gig opportunities, and uh, really a lot of predictions out there. But Intuit most recently uh, provided a prediction that by 2020, about 40 percent of the American workers will offer some kind of contribution to the gig economy. You know, I will say, as Courtney and I brainstormed about what we wanted to present to you all today, we came to the table with our own preconceived notions and some myths about what gig, wor gig workers look like. Um, and in all topics, there are typically some stereotypes that we can come to the table with. Um, and, but it really is easy to assume, you know, with the baseline of companies like Uber and Lyft, uh, that the, the gig workers, the type of work that they do are typically ride hail or those Uber and Lyft companies. Uh, they might deliver food like Uber Eats or Grubhub, and they may pick up shifts in the services industry, say restaurant and retail. Courtney and I have a lot of clients in the restaurant and retail space. We are seeing a lot of opportunities for gig workers in that, that industry. But overall, those mostly task-oriented jobs is what the assumption people make. And even Courtney and I thought you know, the work that they do is really around those more task-oriented jobs. And from when it comes to the types of people who gig, some of the myths around the personality traits or just the characteristics that people kind of come to mind at first when polling around the office and just talking to industry experts and even our own um, expert judgment, we hear a lot of things around they might be only millennials and they might not have a whole lot of interest in career growth. Uh, but what we'd like to do here today before we really jump into it is to bust some of those myths. Um, according to a, a report by McKinsey recently that uh, you know, the assumption here is not, it's not just ride hail or food or service delivery, task-oriented uh, roles that make up that gig economy work, but those knowledge-intensive or creative op occupations are really the largest and fastest-growing segments of the freelance economy. So when you think about the traditional easy, you, you can picture Uber and driving, but there's a whole other economy around those creative, those IT-focused jobs that are making up that gig economy. And as I mentioned, the economy has improved, so more than half of these gig economy workers began freelancing by choice and not necessi necessity. And so that's continued over the course of the last couple of years, that people are entering the gig economy in droves, and they're doing so not because they have to, but because they want to. And looking at these demographic graphs, you can see that there is a good shakeup. Of course, there are some truths to that. You see a higher percentage of millennials in some of these categories, but you also see higher participation among other age groups around 30 to 49, especially for those who want to sell something online, whether it's their services, their creative designs, or something else that they can offer to the economy. Another thing I just wanted to call out that Carol or that Cheryl mentioned is, you know, freelancing has been around a long time. And so as you dig into the research about what the gig economy really is and how it's defined, it really started with freelancers, right? There's artists, there's um, folks that, you know, maybe they went to a craft fair at some point and sold things. Um, and what has, what has happened with the advent of technology is that now people have more of a platform to do so and, and reach a broader audience. Um, we also found that there's a lot of kind of baby boomers, right, that are late in their career or maybe recently retired and want to supplement their income. So, again, that side hustle piece, right? It's really come up as there are a lot of different folks and a lot of different opportunities out there, um, but the type of gig worker isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all. What we see from the current state of gig, we uh, a lot of predictions out there, and including our own. Uh, we see that the technology is going to rapidly evolve. Um, unemployment is at the, an all-time low, although the most recent jobs report came out, wages are starting to increase, although they have been relatively flat. So we can continue to see this desire for flex work, this desire to be a micro-entrepreneur, uh, not just a side hustle, maybe even creating this opportunity for workers to uh, have a different way they think about their careers. Um, from an uh, economic standpoint, we also see that that gig workforce is going to contribute about $715 billion annually to our economy. And some researchers, again, you know, really predict that over half are going to enter this gig economy workforce. So we have to think about how we're going to inco incorporate the gig worker mindset or the ways that we can incorporate uh, a gig economy into more traditional organizations. 
So why would employees gig? Um, so when we think about employees, there's a few key things that they are wanting in terms of opportunities today. So what we found is that the days of, you know, when you went to your career counselor in college and they said, do this internship and here's the path to doing that career, now there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and furthermore, with technology, employees are going are realizing that they can absolutely have a career and do more work that they actually want to do in a more flexible environment. So flexibility and compensation are probably two of the biggest reasons why employees are kind of going gig. So when we think about flexibility, this is really from a, it can be anything from work hours to location. So for an outmatch example, we've got a sales representative who lives in South America um, and does all the same opportunities and, and really um, reaches clients all across the world, but he lives where he wants to live, and so he's not necessarily tied to an office. So that flexibility is something we're seeing more of this nomadic culture come to shape where people of all different ages, you know, you retire and you want to travel, or you're a millennial and you don't want to be tied down somewhere. Having that flexibility in jobs and being able to um, pick up different work all over the world is really useful. How this even translates to some traditional companies is we're seeing that companies are allowing employees to be, um, be able to pick up shifts all over the country. So say, for example, you work for a more traditional retailer or restaurant, but you want to take a, a vacation somewhere, um, and you want to, rather than take all that time off, you want to make use of, okay, I'm willing to work, you know, a week in that new location. If companies, more traditional companies, can find ways to make use of, of their workers from that aspect, it really does build retention and provide more opportunities and flexibility. Additionally, compensation, you know, there are many gig jobs today that pay competitively to what someone would make in a more traditional role. So, a lot of these platforms that have really brought gig opportunities to the employee have found ways to make it very competitive for not only the employee, but for the employer. So they're finding ways, how can I compensate someone for doing the same work that is now outside the office? And what they're finding also is that some employees are actually more willing to take a, an equal or even a slightly less pay because they have the flexibility. So that's huge, right? And today's kind of the the emphasis on work-life balance, you know, people really want the opportunity to be able to, to do the work they want and do it where they want. And so compensation, while being competitive is still going to win out, having some other benefits is huge. For companies, some things for them to think about, as Cheryl mentioned, you know, this access to niche skills and expertise is huge. So we think about like IT, for example. Um, you know, when you think about architects and, and other folks that work in the IT world, it's really beneficial to have a strong skill set on staff. But for smaller companies, they can't always afford to ha employ all these people with a very specialized skill set when they don't necessarily have an abundance of work all the time. So for companies who want to almost outsource that, but more offer it to contractors and freelancers, that's something where, where we're seeing a sort of this um, new opportunities open for companies that just want to hire specific skills. Also that scalability, if you think about seasonality, right, some companies need to ramp up. So retail is a great example where during the holiday season, they really need to ramp up their workers, but they don't have an expectation to keep people on the payroll long term. They could make use of more of a gig concept and actually be able to scale in response to that business need but not then have to lay everyone off or let folks go after that season ended. Rather, they can sort of scale up or down as the business need appears. And then just having that flexible team, you know, having flexibility in who you hire and the jobs that they can do, being able to offer people different opportunities, all goes into you know, how companies can really be successful and make use of that kind of gig style of work. So when we compare kind of traditional companies and gig companies, there's a lot of benefits to both. So when we think about traditional companies, um, there are a few things that really stand out as key benefits. So first of all, having more stable, consistent work. So for employees, you got to think about at the end of the day, they are still depending on that paycheck to feed their family, to pay their bills. And so knowing that you are guaranteed or you can expect so many hours a week from a job is really going to continue to drive people to more of those traditional 
companies in traditional roles. Secondly, benefits. You know, there are things not only such things like um, paid time off, uh, but also short-term disability, maternity leave. All those types of benefits are something that we're consistently seeing traditional companies are sort of winning over gig companies because most gig companies treat their workers as 1099 contractors. Um, so they're not necessarily getting all the same benefits a full-time worker would. Labor protections, you know, obviously being able, when we think about, again, benefits and, and just being able to, you know, have that job to go back to, you are protected when you're in more of that traditional environment versus there's a lot of gray area with gig, economy, gig companies right now and gig roles, right? And just in terms of, you know, it, it's interesting, the research says things from, you know, is this a way for employees, employers, I'm sorry, to get around some of those those benefits, right? If you don't actually have a full-time employee on your staff, you're not as required to offer as many things. But on the flip side for employees, how do we ensure they're protected um, when an employee and when an individual opts to only do gig type of work? So there's a lot of, of discussion right now about what makes sense. Formal training and onboarding. So at the end of the day, we know that offering someone formal onboarding and training opportunities when they start a job is really critical to ensuring they're successful in the long term. So traditional companies have typically have a much more robust kind of training program and onboarding program, whether it's you know one day or a few weeks, they have things a little bit more kind of laid out versus gig companies tend to you bring a contractor on, sometimes there's you know a handbook that's passed on or some other guidelines, but it's much lighter touch. And then lastly, career progression. Um, so this is one that, that's interesting. I actually have not thought about this until we were doing some of this research is, you know, it's interesting. Traditional companies offer much more of kind of that formalized career progression. So you can come in at one level and it's very clear what your career path could be, right? And, and you actually have more opportunities also, if you're engaged in the right way, to even make some lateral moves to, to kind of gain new expertise or skill sets in addition to, you know, gaining perhaps management or team experience. But from a gig perspective, it's not always as clear cut. So it's more about, you know, how do you go deep in your skill set rather than kind of climb the ladder. Now if we switch gears and talk about gig companies, um, there are different benefits that we see as, as those companies can offer. So we've talked about this a little bit already, but flexible schedule. Um, so it is something that, you know, for all gig companies, generally they can offer a super flexible schedule to their employees. Now, that can look a few different ways. You know, some employees say, or some employers will say, you have to work eight hours a day, but you can work those eight hours whenever you want. So I read some stories about folks who, you know, prefer to start their day at 5 a.m., work till 9 a.m., take lunch, finish, and then, you know, they're near a beach, and so they spend their afternoon surfing and, and doing other things. Um, so there's that type of schedule. And then there's also the one where you want to split your 40 hours seven days a week, go for it. You know, no one minds. Um, or if you want to consolidate that and only work two or three days a week, you can do that too. So now you have a really flexible schedule and you really have some ways you can engage the employee as to what makes sense for them. You're a night owl, you're a morning person, you get to pick. Secondly, autonomy in the role. So being able to not necessarily have a boss that's sort of hovering over your shoulder or checking in on your work all the time is something that a lot of employees find as super energizing, right? Um, and I think what we're seeing is especially, it's interesting for both millennials, right, who maybe there's that stereotype of they don't necessarily want, you know, someone telling them what to do. They want to make decisions for themselves. But also from kind of a baby boomer perspective, they're at the end of their career or they've left a more formal career and they're wanting to do something different. They want to be able to have that autonomy and ownership in what they want to do. And really being able to choose when they want to work and what work they want to take is, is really energizing and motivating to them. Having this specialized focus. Um, so this is something else where, you know, being able to really go deep in your area and know it so intimately that you are considered an expert is also very motivating to employees. Um, the research continuously shows that, you know, being able to say you're an expert in something and know it in and out is something that's always going to, to motivate workers to continue to build their knowledge, build their expertise, and essentially be more, more um, 
useful in the workplace. Just that autonomy and ownership of work. So we talked a little bit about you know having autonomy in the role and you know not having that boss kind of checking your work, but having the ability to decide how you want to do your work and what approach you want to take, how quickly you want to move, et cetera, and not necessarily having some of the bureaucracy of more traditional companies to work through and gain buy-in and, and that collaboration piece is actually also motivating. So we find that gig workers in general, you know, they really do think of themselves as an entrepreneur and owner of their work. And oftentimes we see higher quality work products because of that sense of autonomy and ownership of work. Uh, being able to really go deep and specialize and offer the skill set where they feel that they're valued because they have been picked up for that work and they're ready to dive deep into that project so that truly that, that autonomy, that ownership is also driving higher work quality products. Absolutely. And that's a good tie into the last one, so work selectivity. You know, employees now have the option of, especially if you choose to go through a kind of a platform that presents opportunities to you, you now have the option to pick the company, pick the work, pick when the deadline is. I mean, you can really pick what makes sense for you. And having that that sense of, I have a choice now, is, is huge. And to Cheryl's point, it leads to better work quality. We see that when individuals know that they are ultimately responsible for something, they then deliver a better product as well. You know, and how, thinking about how we can stay competitive, you know, a, a lot of organizations that find uh, they find opportunities to incorporate more gig type mindset into their traditional environment. It oft, often comes from a project need or a, a specialized project that they're trying to incorporate gig workers into their organization. So whether you are a gig company or you're an organization or a team looking to utilize this gig mindset into more of a traditional organization format, when you think about how we incorporate that human component into the gig worker economy, we want to make sure that people are hiring the right people by using consistent process and tools just as you would uh, for a more traditional or full-time employee. So we see a lot of use of assessments, um, you, know, uh, you know, cognitive assessments, personality assessments, situational judgment tests, skills testing even, especially for those creative or IT type roles. So when you think about hiring the right people, you want to make sure you're using those consistent tools and process just as you would. Just because they're a gig worker doesn't mean that all rules go out the window. You're hiring for a specific skill set. And anything that you can use to increase your validity in that process or your opportunity to bring in a solid hire, whether they're full-time or they're just for the day, you want to make sure that the consistent tools and process are there. I think also on that point, Cheryl, you know, there's also this myth out there that companies like an Uber or Lyft are just kind of willing to take anyone off the street. And what, what you find is that actually putting in some consistent tools and processes to ensure you're selecting people for the right job is going to lead to retaining those people, lower turnover, you know, driving those business out outcomes that gig companies think about just like a traditional company does. Right. So it's still important that you get the right people in the role. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to be filling that position as quickly as you're hiring for it. That's right. And when you scale those recruiting efforts, too, you want to make sure you're focusing on bringing in the right people by not just grabbing people off the street, just as Courtney mentioned. You want to make sure that those recruiting efforts are really focused around um, the, the exact skill set that you're looking for. Again, not just because we're looking at gig workers or people who are looking to come on board on a temporary basis, that doesn't mean you throw all the rules out the window. Uh, you want to make sure those recruiting efforts are really focused and uh, streamlined based off the project or the team or the initiative you're bringing in these gig workers into the organization. And being intentional and thoughtful of the skill set that's needed rather than just say, hey, we need a whole team of graphic designers. Uh, being really thoughtful about what kind of graphic designer who's going to work 40 hours a week or one day on your team, mm -hmm. what kind of personality traits or what kind of skill set you know you need, but what kind of mesh is going to be there. So what kind of makeup is going to gel well with the team? Just because it's a gig worker, you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure that you're not overlooking and being really thoughtful into the type of person that you want to bring into the team. For sure. 
And also, I think as a recruiter, you have the opportunity to message the role in a different way. So in a tight labor market, how do you make your role sound better than another opportunity they may come across? Mm -hmm. um, how do you really kind of hone in on what it is that's going to attract people to your company? What are the benefits they're going to receive? So that's where you can really start to put your own flair on it and attract the right people. Mm -hmm. And if you're ahead of the game and you're using a platform and skipping the recruiter piece uh, to actually connect yourself with a gig a uh, gig group of people to come into your organization, you want to make sure that messaging in a job description or what you are looking for is very thoughtful and intentional as well. Um, it's not a whole lot of time to, to get ramped up in what you um, are looking for as a gig worker. And on the flip side, the employer uh, or project team wants to be very clear about what they need. And the more intentional and specific you can be when grabbing people off of a platform or connecting yourself to a gig economy workforce, being intentional and thoughtful about what, what it is that you're looking for and needing right up front is very helpful. What we've also seen that organizations who um, train their gig workers and treat them just as they would their full-time and traditional staff tend to have higher outcomes and retention on the repeat gig, gig opportunities. So training uh, gig workers uh, through either those short onboarding efforts or having some kind of short or half-day culture orientation, even though they're here not for a long time, but for enough time to make an impact on your product and your business and overall your bottom line. Offering those training opportunities engages those workers very quickly, and it gets them level set on what it is that they're trying to do here. And of course, the more opportunities you have to train them, the more likely that they are uh, to seek additional opportunities with you to come back. It's always going to be a little bit faster ramp up period when you have gig workers who are willing to return. And most gig workers are willing to return when they feel like they're invested in and they have a good experience. And I think that's a great point, Cheryl, that you know one of the biggest difference differences in traditional versus gig companies is you are actually always trying to get these people to come back, mm -hmm. right? How do you ensure they have such a positive experience at time one that when you have that same need next year or next season or next quarter or next week that a, you have a base of folks that ideally you can call, right, and get people up to speed faster because they already know the expectations, but also that it's just a positive experience where now they tell their friends, now they tell other potential colleagues, and suddenly it, it, it really helps your recruiting efforts. Mm -hmm. Because from a recruiter perspective, it's actually just as much work to hire a gig worker often as it is to hire a full-time employee. And furthermore, they're not even sticking around as long. So really ensuring that the positive experience is huge. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we all, as professional workers, whether you're looking for a, a full-time career at one company or you're a gig economy worker, for having opportunities to select into professional development or seeking professional development opportunities, either at the company that you're gigging for or outside of that, those opportunities that are provided by organizations tend to have higher outcomes and repeat gig workers as well. So having um, and being intentional and thoughtful about those opportunities where you can have those gig workers participate in more professional development opportunities that you offer more of your traditional full-time staff. So we see training and development uh, really opened up to people who might want to have their side hustle or might be their full-time hustle uh, of wanting to kind of grow their professional skill set outside of um, outside of a, a more of a traditional situation. So being a part of a, a gig economy or being a part of a gig at a company, if they have those opportunities to opt into more of your formal programmatic training and development programs or initiatives, we find that those training opportunities really help them stay engaged and you know come back for opportunities in the future. Mm -hmm. And often traditional companies have those already set up. So it's actually easier sometimes for them to, once you can figure out kind of the platform on how to bring people on, then retaining them actually becomes a little bit easier because you just sort of fold them into those same opportunities and provide, kind of to Cheryl's point earlier, treat them like regular employees so that they're provided the same opportunities. And obviously that makes more sense for more longer term temporary assignments. Um, you know, one day trainings or one day needs for gig workers is not necessarily um, a good opportunity for that, but anytime you can offer training, uh, that will be fantastic. And then it's important to remember to engage gig workers if you do incorporate them into your organization and engage them because feedback does flow both ways. 
bringing in people from the outside of an organization uh, with a deep career or, excuse me, a deep skill set that they have some expertise that they can flow information back into your process, not just from the product that they deliver for you or the service that they're providing, but just general feedback of the way they've seen it done at other organizations that they've gigged for, gigged for or other ways they've seen it done really well. So that feedback and opportunities to have it flow both ways, both for them as a rating standpoint of how well they did, but how well this organization is doing by either offering gig workers opportunities or what else they can change as part of their business. So I think it's a good, really uh, valuable information can be a, a great source of those innovative ideas, but also just having a, a two-way flow of feedback will really benefit not only the gig worker, but the company overall. So at Outmatch, we really focus on how do we help companies hire better? How do we help pe get people in the right job so that they not only do well, but they enjoy it? And so kind of a different approach Cheryl and I took as we were kind of pulling this together is we started to dig into, so we know competencies are important to the success, and person job fit is super important. But are there success factors for gig workers that look a little different than traditional? And so I wanted to share with you all what we found because we, we thought it was pretty interesting that not only is it about putting the right people in the right job, but also thinking about kind of what that success profile looks like may look a little different. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, what you're seeing are some of the competencies that we found as really important to gig workers. And when we talk about competencies, these are kind of a grouping of knowledge, skills, abilities, and personality traits that drive success in a role. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side are competencies that we have found are super important. So starting with adaptability, you know, gig workers are often thrown into a lot of different situations, and they really have to be able to live in ambiguity and figure things out for their own. They've got to adapt to different companies, different jobs, different managers. There's much less continuity in terms of what the environment looks like, so it's important that you hire people who are going to thrive in that environment rather than be frustrated. Second, planning and organizing. Time management is super critical for gig workers. Often if they have multiple gigs at once, they now have to really think about, okay, how do I get this project done, that project done, what are the competing timelines, how much time do I have to get everything done, and furthermore, do I have bandwidth to actually take on something else? So being very planful and organized with their time is really important, and you need people who are going to be those self-motivators to kind of own that for themselves. Relationship management. So even though this is just one worker perhaps doing a contract gig, even if it's for a day, being able to build relationships within the company to understand that bigger picture, how does my one role fit into the larger strategy of the organization or the business outcomes we're trying to achieve, all that actually plays into whether or not someone is successful. So being able to build relationships within the organization quickly and efficiently is really something that's going to drive success. Furthermore, we know that gig workers don't always have as much collaboration. Right? You're hired for a project which lasts a couple weeks. You may not necessarily have the opportunity to work as part of a team. But if you can hire people that are willing to branch out, get to know other people in the organization, understand how everything connects together, you tend to find that less that they are actually operating in such a silo. And so relationship management is another thing that we saw as, as really important. Communication, being able to communicate effectively, being able to articulate what is the job, ask the right questions at the beginning. There's nothing worse than delivering a project and then realizing you are totally off base as to what those expectations are. So you need to find workers who are going to ask those questions early on, are going to ensure that they understand what's being asked of them, what's the timeline, what are the expectations, and they're going to check in throughout the process or throughout the project so that they are on the right track. And then finally, learning agility. This is a little bit of a buzzword in today, and, and we're hearing this more and more from clients, but I think it really what we're trying to say is what's their runway to learn new skills? You know, are these people that are going to continue to fine-tune their skills? So if you're an IT expert 
How do you know what the latest and greatest technology is out there? What are the new methods for getting something done? Do you know a lot of systems as it pertains to your skill set? Having that kind of agile learning mindset, kind of continuous learning focus is something that's really going to drive these people to be intrinsically motivated to get better. And you really need people who are willing to do so rather than someone that says, well, I don't know that system, so good luck. I can't do that part of the project. You need people who are kind of willing to go above and beyond and really figure things out for themselves. Then on the right-hand side of the screen here, what you're seeing are personality traits. The personality traits are those innate tendencies or natural, natural abilities even that make someone who they are. So if you think about different personality traits, these roll up into those competencies. So the ability for someone to display a competency as it relates to a job is going to be impacted by some of their natural style. And so when we looked at the data to understand, you know, what are some of those personality traits that are consistent across gig workers, we went back, we started with these competencies and said, okay, where do we find consistencies in people that display these competencies well? And so a couple things that were kind of interesting and probably not super surprising is there were six or so traits that kind of continuously stuck out. So multitasking. While it probably isn't surprising that someone who is going to succeed at gig work is going to enjoy variety, what may be a little bit surprising is actually someone that's too high multitasking. So someone who is constantly looking to fight fires and always kind of chase the new shiny object is actually going to be a little bit less successful than someone who's more in the mid-range. Just as someone who is on the really low end of multitasking, who maybe really wants to work more methodically, do one thing at a time, that's not going to be successful either. So it's that mid-range we actually found is, is really what's going to lead to success. And work intensity is another one where that mid-range is really the sweet spot. People that have a ton of energy and stamina to get through the workday. So that would be on the very high end of work intensity. Very, you know, the type of energizer bunny type of person, right? They're getting up early. They go, go, go all day. You know, in some ways you would think, well, that would make sense why that type of person would be a good gig worker. But what we found is that those people are actually become impatient and they actually almost get bored easily when they're asked to do tasks that they don't see as important to their job. And so when you think about project work, while a lot of it is stuff you may enjoy, there's going to be some administrative pieces to it. And especially if you're switching companies, there's always going to be paperwork or other things that may be involved. And so that kind of mid-work intensity is actually going to serve you well. Now, on the very low end of work intensity, if you have someone who really wants to work a little bit slower, take breaks, that may not necessarily be the type of person that's going to succeed um, and furthermore, if you think about from an, a pay or compensation standpoint, the people that are going to succeed are the ones that can probably handle a few different jobs at once. A few others I wanted to call out was just process focused. So this really leads to organization. You know, do you know all the timelines that are expected? Are you organized in the way that you approach tasks and get work done? Um, we actually want people who are pretty organized. Um, you can imagine probably makes sense, right, why someone who was a little bit less organized may struggle to keep up with multiple gigs at once. That doesn't mean they can't handle one at a time, but keeping in touch, understanding what needs to happen as things shift, just keeping everything organized could become a little bit of a barrier. Criticism tolerance, or how you receive feedback. Being high criticism tolerance and really kind of having a thick skin you know, you're not necessarily have a whole lot of time to get to know someone before you've got to get feedback from them. And so having that thick skin is really going to help you in that you can be blunt with others, you can take feedback well, you can ask for feedback and be open to it rather than being a little bit more sensitive and taking it personally. So having high criticism tolerance is another one. High follow through, finishing what you started, ensuring that all your T's are crossed and I's are dotted. You know, that comes time when, when you're delivering that final product, you want to be sure everything is complete. And then lastly, optimism. This is another important one where you really need to have people who can kind of assume everything will work out, who recognizes that from a week to week, your workload's going to look different. You may have dry spells, but that's okay. That's the nature of the gig economy. 
And yet, on the flip side, you may have times with an abundance of work. So you need people who can ebb and flow and aren't going to just worry and ruminate when they don't necessarily have a job lined up for next week. So in conclusion, kind of before we open it up to questions from, from the folks on the phone, I wanted to just kind of share, you know, all this being said, where do we go from here? Um, so first of all, a couple recommendations, you know, really training talent acquisition for all types of candidates. It's important for recruiters to understand that the process, while it should be consistent um, and more traditional assessment types, whether it's a behavioral or personality assessment, a reference checking, a culture tool, all of those assessments still work really well for gig workers. The difference is going to be how do you market to these people? How do you pitch the job? What's your messaging? And some of those recruitment messages are actually where things will start to shift and look a little different for different jobs. So it's important that your recruiters are really trained and understand how to position jobs to all different candidate types and know how to build rapport quickly. Secondly, we really want to encourage all companies to think gig. And what this means is be strategic about what roles are gig roles. So for example, you may have a one-time project where it requires some deep IT expertise. That's the perfect opportunity to think about how do you bring in a freelancer, right, a gig worker for that job. But if it's an ongoing project for multiple years, or if this is something you have every single month, this could still potentially be a good gig role, but it also may make more sense to have hire a full-time person. How much interaction do they need to have? What if you have to train that person every month? What are the hours you're spending doing so? Those are just some important considerations before you, you decide whether a job is gig or not. And that's really going back to being intentional and thoughtful about how to initially even get started with gig workers in your organization as a whole. Um, so really coming back together around being you know, strategic, intentional, and thoughtful because certain roles and projects require a little bit more heavy lift, while others might just have a day in the life or a day project. For sure. The other thing is how do you get creative about how your company can offer gig benefits? So I thought it was great. I, I talked to a few different clients about kind of what are some things they're looking into. And one thing I found really awesome is I have a few restaurant clients today that are exploring opportunities to basically hourly workers download an app for their company. So you're an hourly worker in Dallas. You want to take a road trip for a few weeks and go work in Portland, Oregon. You now, through the, the app for the company, can look for shifts in Portland, Oregon, and work there for a few weeks. And then when you're driving back, you want to stop in Denver, Colorado, you can find some shifts there. And it really allows their workers to be a little bit more transient. Now, you still have a kind of home base, right? But what they're finding is it's a great way to engage people and make it feel like you have a little bit more flexible of a work environment. Now, they're still working out some of, you know, how do we actually staff, how do we ensure we have people, and what percentage of employees can we count on that may just pick up a shift. But it really is starting to open the, the network for them to allow employees to try different things and have a little bit more flexibility. So things like that where you can get creative, where you know you're a company who has great employees, you just need to find ways to help them think of you as a little bit less traditional this is a great opportunity, and I'm sure there's plenty of other ideas out there, too. And that really feeds into that flexibility component for both the employer and the worker. Um, I think because of the way that technology has provided us opportunities to do things in all over the world in different places, uh, having that opportunity to, yeah, as an hourly worker, be flexible as well is just so tremendously helpful to the happiness and the engagement into the, the company. Um, it, it's just something that that flexibility component we want to see. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then lastly, you know, think about employees of the future a little differently than you do today. So company culture and engagement matters more than ever. We're finding that gig workers want to be engaged just like every other worker. They want to be thought of as a full-time employee rather than this disposable employee that is here for a short amount of time. They really do want to understand what's the bigger picture. What are the training opportunities? What if I wanted to come full-time? What would that look like? 
And so in finding ways to engage them, whether that's including them in an engagement survey or just soliciting feedback right after a project, um, thinking about you know, how do you approach someone after they've completed a gig and say, hey, I'd love to consider you for future ones. Can I kind of keep you on um, our short list? Things like that are really encouraging, and what we're finding is some of the most successful gig workers depend primarily on repeat business. And so another way to, to kind of think differently is that how do you retain those folks and really make them feel like they're part of your company culture? I also think we need to think differently about careers. You know, it's not so much that you join a company and you're there for your full career, 30, 40 years, whatever it may be, but now com- employees want to kind of hop around and as a former recruiter myself, I can remember looking at resumes going, gosh, this person's hopped around a ton. I'm not sure that they're really here to stay. Will they be interested in my opportunity? And we've really got to shift our mindset because nowadays employees are recognizing they can pick up a lot of different skill sets that way and be more well-rounded. And so you kind of have to change your, your mindset a little bit about what makes a good employee and what a career may look like a little bit more of a jungle gym than a ladder and as we sort of have thought about it traditionally. And so how do you help offer people a career where it's, I worked in a lot of companies doing this type of thing, I'm building out more of a, a breadth of experience than depth or vice versa. And so just thinking about that differently is something that I'd encourage you all to do, whether you're a traditional company or a gig company, just kind of helping paint that picture for employees is going to make them successful in the long term. Okay, and with that, we'll open it up to questions and comments. We'd love to hear more from you all as to, you know, what are some of those gig challenges you're facing or you're thinking about. All right, thank you guys both for the presentation today. Really good information, and I think this is really good future-focused stuff that we're all going to have to know. So let's get into some questions that we have from our audience. First question comes from Lori. She asks, if there is any research that you know about that has measured or rated the quality or desirability of companies or platforms that hire gig workers. Great question. Thanks, Lori. Um, So I think when, so just to make sure I'm understanding that, Holly, so research on the quality of gig workers, right? So how do we know why you should hire someone from one company versus another? Am I following that correctly? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Yep, that makes sense. Um, so great question. You know, I'm not so sure. I, I'd have to look in more. I think it depends on the platforms you're looking at. Um, I know when I've used gig workers in the past, what I've generally done is look to understand reviews, right? Because the same worker can sign up for multiple platforms. And so it's more about what's the vetting process that they go to, and most of those companies will make that transparent on their website. So I would look to see, you know, what are the the sort of hurdles that employees have to jump through to be a quote-unquote certified professional on a specific site. So I would go more to kind of comparing, and, and it really depends on what's important to you, mm-hmm. right? Is this a job where when if you were to hire someone full time, you'd require certain certifications or minimum qualifications. And if so, I would compare those two platforms or two gig companies to understand which one aligns better to how you would treat it if you were hiring that person full time. And I think I heard a second part of Lori's question about companies being rated and how they're they are being rated as on the flip side of that of those who um, buy gig workers. So thinking about more of like a great place to work for kind of a survey based off of their gig worker component. And I haven't seen personally anything research around that component uh, yet, but what I have seen are incorporations of, you know, gig type thoughts, uh, uh, gig type thoughts, I don't even know what that means, but having the ability to have flexibility, that work-life balance component that attracts people to the gig uh, mindset is also going to, we're starting to see higher trends on people and companies that are being rated highly on great places to work that offer those non-traditional benefits around workplace, work-life balance, being able to have remote work, not calling all of their employees back into the office. So that component of not necessarily just employing gig workers, but offering the benefits that gig workers enjoy are increasing great place to work scores. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. 
All right, thanks girls. So Lori, if we did not quite answer your question there, please be sure and clarify that in that Q&A box and then we'll go ahead and revisit what you wanted to know. But at this time, we'll move on to a question from Francesco. Francesco asks, how do gig employees impact a company's culture since they are not performance appraised, don't receive training, and they do have a flexible schedule? So I think a lot of that does depend on how much interaction they have with the overall group. Now, if they're gigging on a particular task or they're an individual and one component to the project, if they're not using some of those competencies or not being able to, uh, an opportunity isn't presented for them to be leveraging those communication competencies, they are going to not only feel like an isolated um, worker, but they're also not going to have any ability to influence the culture. Now, for those that have the interactions and they're working as part of a larger team, even if it's a totally gig team, I really do see some influence on the culture in general. Even if you have someone who's a temporary worker who's not going to be full-time and not going to be there for a long time, they already have immediate impact on how it, it feels to work with other people. So I think from a, a culture standpoint, over the long term, it's going to be hard to measure those components, uh, but the impact is there. We're humans at the end of the day, whether we're gig workers or full-time full traditional workers. And so I think that, that that influence around culture is something that we're going to continue to measure and see. It's just a mindset shift of even though they're, they're temporary, they're still going to be impacting in some way or another. All right, thank you guys so much. Our next question comes from Tanya, and she asks, how can you change the mindset of talent acquisition who don't understand the concept of gig workers who do short-term assignments versus job hoppers? I think that's an excellent question, and I would encourage um, individuals to go back to that demographic slide that I provided, and I think I do have a reference to the that study from the Pew Research Center. So it is a, a matter of, um, desire and interest in doing gig work versus out of necessity. So I think a lot of people, especially talent acquisition and recruiters, might make that myth or that assumption stereotype that gig workers are doing this because they're unemployable and they, they can't get a full-time job. And that's just not the case. The research and the data around the demographics show that it is voluntary, at least half of the time, and it's really out of that desire to have a flexible work environment where they can go deep into their expertise. So it's about really miss, but busting that myth around the demographic and just providing that talent acquisition team with the research around who these um, individuals actually are. And, you know, like Courtney and I were talking about this from our recruiter days. You know, back in the day, there were a couple of things of, you know, not being at the same job for five to ten years considered job hopping. And now if we see people here for one or two years, even if they're not gig workers, it's just a mind shift that happens over time. I think another thing I would add is I would, I would challenge those talent acquisition folks to think about this as a way to expand your talent pool, mm -hmm. right? Like in today's economy, it's really hard to find good qualified workers. And so if you can kind of use this as another talent pool, I actually think it will help you fill positions faster. So I would encourage them to, you know, we're thinking differently about careers, we're thinking differently about how people, like what makes someone a, a qualified worker, and I think you, you really have to do that differently too when it comes to hiring. And one other point I'd like to add there is really around the different and variety of experience that people gain by going from one gig to the next and one company to the next. So if they are picking up different ways of doing things and having exposure to organizations that do things a little bit differently, they are more well-rounded as an employee or an expert than they would be by staying at the same company for 15 years yeah. or 10 years or five years. All right, thanks again for that answer. We've got about two or three minutes, so we'll go ahead and take another question. Alex wants to know, if we have a gig employee, but the organization is asking them to meet deadlines quicker, making them work more on company terms, uh, what do we do there? That's a great question. So pushing, just to play that back, so pushing a, a gig worker to to meet more of traditional deadlines and uh, to, to move a little bit faster. Is, right. that, is that right? 
keeping them on company terms instead of working on their own terms like a gig worker is more apt to do, I think. Got it. Yeah, so one of the benefits we talked about it with gig workers is they have more autonomy and control over the work they're doing. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like what happens when you're hiring workers who have to play by the company rules. So, yeah, I mean, I think in that case, it's about setting the expectations up front. Like, I think that's where, you know, again, leaning on your talent acquisition folks to understand, okay, the type of person that's going to do well in this role is the type of person that prefers some structure and guidance that is really crystal clear from the beginning. And I think where, where sometimes this kind of um, becomes a rub is that, you know, you get halfway through a project and the expectations change or the, the outcome that's expected starts to change. So I think as long as companies are upfront about that and your recruiters can share that sentiment from the beginning, it's much easier. Again, there's a certain person that's going to appreciate that. I'm sure there are gig workers out there that don't necessarily want to decide for themselves, right? And that ambiguity makes things a little bit, it takes longer. So in some ways, setting those expectations early, kind of here are the company rules, will make things more efficient. But I think you just have to communicate that from the very beginning. And if it's the train has already left the station with that particular employee, it's, I think it's super important to not just assume that they're not going to be able to do that. It's probably not assume that they're not going to be able to meet more of that traditional guidance or the expectations of a regular employee. But having that communication open up and those expectations crystal clear at that standpoint um, is going to communication. It always comes back to communication, always wanting to be very clear on those expectations regardless of the type of employee it is. All right, cool. Thanks so much for those answers. And we have reached the bottom of the hour, so we'll go ahead and wrap up for the day. Just a reminder to everyone on this webcast, today's presentation has been approved for HR, CI, and SHRM credit. Give us about 24 hours and then head on over to your My HCI profile and go to the My Learning Journey section in that drop-down menu to get those credit codes. One more big thank you to Outmatch and our presenters today. And for all of us here at HCI, thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.